I'm Bob Riley, the director of the Westminster Institute, and welcome to our ongoing series of lectures via Zoom. And I'm particularly happy today to welcome back to the Westminster Institute, Arun Maroof, who spoke to the Westminster Institute uh, less than two years ago uh, on the subject, sub subject of Al-Shabaab and Somalia, about which I'll tell you a little more in a moment after introducing Haroon, who's had three decades of experience in journalism covering, covering Somalia and its struggles with war, terrorism, uh, piracy, and drought since the early 1990s, and is one of the founders of the independent Somali media, which emerged after the collapse of the repressive government in 1991. In the past, Haroon worked for the Associated Press and the BBC as a reporter in Somalia. He is the longest serving editor of the Voice of America's Somali service from July 2008 to the present moment. In addition to his responsibilities as a senior editor, he introduced hard hitting programs at VOA uh, including investigative reports and series programs. In March 2018, he launched the Investigative Dossier, a bi-weekly groundbreaking investigative program and the first of its kind by Somali media. Haroon thinks it's the greatest journalism work in his career. His work influenced policy changes by the Somali government. He has more than uh, 100,000 Twitter followers in the Horn of Africa. In 2018, Arun released a book co-authored with his VOA colleague, Dan Joseph, titled Inside Al-Shabaab, The Secret History of Al-Qaeda's Most Powerful Ally. It tells the story of the militant group that is still trying to overthrow Somalia's government and turn the country into a terrorist haven. The book was well received in Somalia and internationally. Haroon's lecture on the topic of his book gained more than 106,000 views on West Westminster's YouTube channel, making it the all-time champion so far. Today, Haroon will give his analysis of Al-Shabaab attacks this year, plus their strategic plan and threat to Somalia and beyond. Welcome back, Haroon. Thank you very much, Robert. I'm grateful for you inviting me back. I'm also grateful for the kind introduction, and I'm happy to be back. The topic we're going to talk about today is Al-Shabaab in recent uh, months and last a couple of years, what Al-Shabaab has been doing. Before I move on to Al-Shabaab subject, I wanted to uh, open my statement and my lecture by saying that I'm speaking to you uh, on my capacity as co-author of the book, as an, an, as an expert of Al-Shabaab. I'm not representing the Voice of America, my employers, and my views are only mine. Having said that, and moving on to the situation in Somalia and Al-Shabaab, the good news today that emerged from Somalia is that the federal government of Somalia and the leaders of five regions and Mogadishu have agreed an electoral model. Uh, Somalia has been preparing for a long time to hold popular elections, one person, one vote election. There were a lot of optimism that this popular election will take place. But one more time, Somali leaders have agreed to hold an indirect election. That's an election based on clan system and a power sharing system. Mm -hmm. I will, the, the reason that the type of elections in Somalia are important is because politics have dictated security and the government re response to Al-Shabaab. Every four years, a leader and a parliament are elected. That means any government that comes to power 
has a very, very short time to deal with Al-Shabaab or to make progress in securing the country. During the first two years of any government, the government tries to adapt to the situation, come up with a plan to govern the country and to fight Al-Shabaab. The next two years, any govern, government that is in power prepares for the next election and starts campaigning. So there is very little time to fight against Al-Shabaab. There's very little time to plan a strategy against extremism and terror and to execute that. That's why it's very important that elections and politics have negatively impacted on the war against Al-Shabaab. This is also important because whoever comes to power changes the leaders of the security agencies in the country. And changing the security agencies and the leadership of these different apparatus, different branches of the government is determined by power sharing, not necessarily the competence of the individuals. I, I understand that the leadership tries very hard in order to appoint a competent person, but it has not worked in the benefit of degrading Al-Shabaab so far. For instance, the Somali federal government leaders and the regional leaders were supposed to implement a strategy to build a Somali national army that takes over responsibility from the African Union mission in Somalia and to fight against Al-Shabaab and liberate Al-Shabaab from the remaining parts of the country. But that strategy has not been implemented during the last three years because of mistrust mm. and bickering between the federal government and the regional leaders. So for the leaders to agree today that they're going to hold another election, that means we are expecting another government to come and that government will decide the strategy and how to approach in the fight against Al-Shabaab. In the meantime, Al-Shabaab has been at ease. They have not been under pressure. They have been under some pressure imposed by the United States, but there has been very insignificant pressure coming from the Somali government and the African Union troops in Somalia. The African Union troops in Somalia have been in the country for 13 years. They have done an amazing job in protecting the government from falling down in light of the attack from Al-Shabaab. They have seized all the major towns from Al-Shabaab, but they have not been able to neutralize and drive Al-Shabaab out of the country. Al-Shabaab has been playing the long-term war since 2011. They have been withdrawing from major towns without putting up a major fight. They have been saving their men to fight the fight in the long term. So this is why it has been very important uh, for Somalia and for its international partners to come up with a strategy to neutralize Al-Shabaab. I'm going back to earlier this year, for instance, when the epidemic 19 came to Somalia in March 2020. March 16 was the first time COVID-19 arrived in Somalia. Uh, Al-Shabaab initially did not take the pandemic very seriously. They gave that generic response like any other uh, extremist uh, groups that the pandemic is only affecting infidels, it's not very serious, but it immediately spread to the rest of the country and it affected some of their members. One of their doctors was killed. Some of, the, some of their members were also killed. Then they started to take it seriously and they have implemented a center to combat the fires. What happened it was that they did not officially announce reduction of the attacks. They did not officially accept ceasefire call from the United Nations Secretary General. They did not officially make any statement, 
but somehow the attacks decreased in April, May, and June significantly. There were different interpretations why the attacks have reduced. Some people have suggested maybe because COVID-19 severely affected Al-Shabaab and they were trying to distance their fighters. They were trying to avoid bringing together fighters into one place in order to avoid getting infected. Some others suggested that it was because since what also happened it was that the number of airstrikes by the United States have also reduced during this period. So the interpretation by some experts is that this was also an opportunity for Al-Shabaab to reorganize itself since this, this relentless airstrikes are not taking place. And the relentless airstrikes have increased in 2017, when President Trump came to power, the president has given a lot of leeway to the commanders to take, to carry out al attacks against Al-Shabaab. So the number of attacks have increased considerably. Uh, this year alone, about nearly 50 airstrikes were carried out in Somalia. That's a record. And we still have a few more months until the end of the year. So these attacks, have disrupted Al-Shabaab movement, the movement of Al-Shabaab leaders. Uh, there were a couple of notable attacks where these airstrikes have killed about 100 militias in each time. So Al-Shabaab stopped graduating new recruits. They have stopped congregating into one places. And certainly the movement of key leaders of Al-Shabaab uh, have either stopped or significantly reduced. But when COVID-19 came and airstrikes have stopped or reduced, Al-Shabaab found an opportunity to make some movements, maybe reorganize itself, maybe to put their infrastructure, their resources into places for future attacks. That's also another reading. The other reading is that um, and this is, uh, can be evidently seen, is that these airstrikes have significantly disrupted the uh, vehicles that are bringing explosives into major towns. We have also seen reduction of Al-Shabaab's major complex attacks on military bases, because this kind of attacks will need gathering of large of large number of militias in certain points in order to attack a military base. So we have seen this significant impact on Al-Shabaab by the airstrikes. But on the other hand, without a clear strategy on the ground, without a ground force taking on Al-Shabaab, airstrikes alone cannot uh, completely neutralize the threat of Al-Shabaab in, in the country. And Al-Shabaab, apart from these airstrikes, have not suffered major losses in battlegrounds uh, for a long time, for nearly 10 years. So I'm mentioning this COVID-19 period because when Somalia opened it up in July and major restrictions were lifted, Al-Shabaab restarted carrying out major attacks within the last four or five weeks, there were heavy attacks in Mogadishu on a um, upscale hotel. There was an attack in Mogadishu Central Prison. There was an attack uh, on a military camp manned by Somali forces and US forces. That happened just very recently this month on September 7, a US soldier was wounded um, in that attack, also four Somali soldiers were killed. But the importance of this attack for Al-Shabaab is that they were attacking a military base um, that um, accommodates, that hosts uh, US soldiers. This is significant because like many 
al qaeda affiliates al qaeda members extremist groups fighting the great infidel the united states is the pinnacle of the jihadism web um, if we go back to the number of uh, attacks that al shabab has conducted against the united states since 2017 three us soldiers and two pentagon contractors were killed in al shabab attacks the most notable attack happened on january 5th uh, in northeastern kenya in mandabe that's when al shabab carried out that complex attack on the air base which is uh, which is uh, used by the united states and kenya forces and that was significant because al shabab bypassed uh, several kenya military bases in order to attack this base where the united states soldiers were based so this is very important it is an al shabab that is sending a message that it can attack the united states and it will attack the united states given the opportunity um, it also shows and gives us an understanding the nature of al shabab which is a transnational organization that has ambitions beyond the borders of somalia uh, al shabab some, sometimes sends mixed messages on in one week you might see them uh, attacking for instance a hotel complex in kenya like the attack in january last year uh, that attack killed more than 20 people and the reason they gave for that attack was in response to president trump recognizing jerusalem as the capital of israel then in another week within that month you might see al shabab calling for the somalis um, to defend their country against crusaders portraying themselves as as a nationalist organization so they gave this mix of organizations but it's a typical transnational terrorist organization that is bent on uh, taking over somalia uh, attacking other countries beyond the borders of somalia so that has been the threat that al shabab posed uh, to somalia as well as to the countries in the region and beyond um after the attack last week uh, in southern somalia where the us soldier was wounded al shabab issued a new threat against the united states uh, emphasizing that they're going to concentrate their attacks on us interests and against the united states this is probably partially uh, propaganda but also they have shown that they can attack um, the united states and the united states interests we have seen uh, there was a major attack a suicidal attack on the biggest air force base in somalia in september last year about a year ago this air base hosts the large number of us troops that are training somali forces uh, nobody expected al shabab to infiltrate the base it's heavily protected it was a suicidal mission all the attackers were killed about 10 of them uh, none were injured on the part of the united states and somali soldiers but the message was that it can attack us soldiers uh, actually a few months later al shabab showed us a video of their leader sending off this attackers who carried out the attack on the on, on the on the military base uh, they showed they did not completely showed his uh, face but they carried his message and they showed him partially um, so al shabab remains a threat to the somali government to the regionists and also it remains a threat uh, to other countries and the other countries interests uh, in somalia I want to talk about the other part of al shabab which is um, despite this threat uh, al shabab itself has been losing uh, some men in recent years within this year alone uh, they have lost three major leaders uh, one of them was killed in february this year 
probably the most important leader Al Shabab lost um, for a long time since the death of its leader, former leader, in September uh, 2014. Uh, this gentleman's name uh, was uh, Bashir Mohammed Mohammed Qorgab. He was a, a ruthless, long time military commander. Uh, the United States uh, put five million dollars on his head and apart from that he was commanding Al-Shabaab wing that operates in northeastern Kenya. The Al-Shabaab group that was behind the attack on Manda Bay, the base in northeastern Kenya where the, uh, two, uh, where the US soldier and two contractors were killed in January. So he was killed in February. That was a major uh, success for the Somali government and for the United States with cooperating on this attack. Uh, in April this year, the United States and Somali government also killed another commander. His name was Yusuf Jiz. He was the head of Al-Shabaab uh, in charge of NGOs. Why are the NGOs important? Because they try to exploit NGOs. They try to Al-Shabaab naturally expelled all the NGOs from Somalia, international NGOs, but they deal directly with uh, local NGOs, who some of them represent international NGOs. So they try to extort, uh, get money from them in order to finance their operations. Uh, this guy was uh, reportedly involved in the ransacking of NGO offices in early 2000 in southwestern Somalia quite ruthless, another ruthless guy, and he was taken out in April this year. And lastly, uh, just the last month, the United, the United States uh, targeted uh, another military commander. Uh, his name was Abdul Qadir Commandos. He was killed um, near the town of Sako in southern Somalia. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning these key leaders is that uh, these attacks had an impact on the operations of Al-Shabaab, as I mentioned earlier. It's targeting not only foot soldiers, but also key leaders. Uh, but when it comes to the long-term strategy in dealing with Al-Shabaab, it might not account very much unless there is a robust on-the-ground strategy in order to uh, fight against Al-Shabaab. And African Union troops have 22,000 soldiers in Somalia, but 22,000 soldiers is uh, insignificant in number compared to the size of Somalia. Somalia is a very large country, and Al-Shabaab is a very deadly uh, organized, militant organization that's bent on uh, playing the long game, fighting the long war, uh, taking their time, and their strategy very, very clearly is to wear off these operations, is to exhaust these military operations against them, whether it's the United States airstrikes or whether it's African Union mission in Somalia, to exhaust these operations and eventually force them to leave Somalia. That's the game they are playing. And uh, not many people doubt that unless Somalia builds its own army, they could eventually retake uh, most of the country unless there is a really very robust viable strategy in order to build a viable Somali national army. One other item I wanted to mention is that because of the length of the African Union mission in Somalia, which is now in its 13th year, and because of the unpredictability of, uh, of air strikes in the long term, uh, because after all these air strikes are to disrupt possible Al-Shabaab attacks and to degrade, they are not necessarily there to completely neutralize the threat of Al-Shabaab. Because of this, there are forces in Somalia who are suggesting perhaps we should talk to with Al-Shabaab. This argument has gathered momentum since the Taliban started talking 
with the United States. They argue that since Al-Shabaab's core members are Somalis, um, that they will be susceptible to negotiations, that they will entertain. While this argument uh, cannot be completely written off, negotiation is, might be possible with Al-Shabaab. I don't think the Somali government ever rejected negotiating with Al-Shabaab, if that is leading to negotiated settlement. But Al-Shabaab uh, has only showed interest in negotiations one time in its entire history. And this is the reason that many people are saying maybe it's perhaps time to talk to Al-Shabaab. That was in 2009, a new government was formed in Djibouti, led by a, the former leader of the Islamic Courts Union, which emerged in Mogadishu in 2006, that uh, almost took over South Central Somalia. And uh, some Salafi scholars have tried to mediate between the new government, led by the former leader of the Islamic Courts, and Al-Shabaab. At that time, Al-Shabaab did not officially announce it was negotiating, but it was negotiating behind the scenes. It was talking to the Salafi leaders, and it came up with two major conditions. The first condition was that Somalia must accept Sharia law. And the second condition was that African Union troops must leave Somalia uh, very soon. Uh, the Somali government, without a negotiation settlement with Al-Shabaab, uh, found it difficult to accept one of the conditions. The first condition was accepted immediately by the Somali parliament, and they have implemented uh, an article passed by the parliament which says that the constitution and the laws of the country will never contradict Sharia. And they have passed a law which says Sharia is the basis for the laws of the country. Still, that was not acceptable to Al-Shabaab. That is very important. Uh, because Al-Shabaab did not recognize that parliament. And I will explain later why they don't recognize. The second condition was the withdrawal of African Union troops from Somalia. That was very important for the government, because if the troops withdraw at that time without the Somali army, Al-Shabaab is going to take over the country. They're going to overthrow the government. So the government could not have accepted that condition. So both conditions, one of which was accepted by the government and they passed a law accepting Sharia as the base for the laws of the country, still that was not acceptable to Al-Shabaab. The indication here is that Al-Shabaab is not going to accept the Somali government and the Somali parliament because they are both apostates. And militant jihadi Salafi groups do not negotiate with groups they describe apostates. But then there are those who say, well, Al-Shabaab, uh, there are those who say Taliban is negotiating with the United States. It's very likely that Al-Shabaab might not reject to negotiate with the United States, but they might not negotiate with the Somali government. But majority of the consensus is that a negotiation will come if the power of Al-Shabaab is, is significantly reduced. And if the scholars of Al-Shabaab because Al-Shabaab has its own scholars who issue these fatwas, and these fatwas uh, have described the Somali government an apostate. Uh, they don't, they believe in killing the apostates in their own interpretation of Islam. And majority of the scholars believe that unless these scholars are engaged and these scholars withdraw with that fatwa, uh, describing or designating the Somali government and the Somali parliament as apostates. 
the road to negotiation or the possibility of negotiating with Al Shabaab is just going to be a futile exercise. But what we have practically seen in Somalia is that Al Shabaab was not the first armed militant Salaf organization in Somalia. There was Al Ittihad al Islam, which had an armed wing in the early 90s from 1991. It fought against Somali administrations in the country. Uh, there were a number of uh, fightings between Somali administrationists and militant organizations. There was a, a fighting in uh, April 1991. There was another fighting in 1992. There was a fighting between Al, between Al Ittihad al Islam and Ethiopia in 1995. All these fightings the, were defeated. The militant organizations were defeated and they were dispersed. And each time they were defeated, they came back to organize themselves in a different form. And the last fighting between Ethiopia and Al-Shabaab in 1995 completely destroyed Al-Ittihad al-Islam, but it split them into two groups. A new Salafi Jihadi group, which later on became Al-Shabaab, and another Salafi group which completely renounced uh, fighting jihad, fighting against Somali administrations, and instead they opted for a peaceful spread of the religion throughout Somalia. So there are a very large segment of the community who believe that, okay, Al-Shabaab will talk, they might talk, but they might change, but there has to be certain uh, pressure, certain developments that can force Al-Shabaab to negotiate. Al-Shabaab is not in a position now in terms of militarily, financially, they are, uh, finan they are taxing population, not only in the areas they control, but in the areas they don't control, including Mogadishu, the capital. They are calling rich people and asking them to give millions of dollars of extortion money in order to finance their operations. So Al-Shabaab is a, is a shadow administration that is also taxing, just like the Somali government, taxing the population, sending attacks, threatening, trying to micromanage people, not only the government and people who work for, but ordinary people, civil society leaders, journalists, others, they are threatening them. So in order to degrade them significantly and force them to negotiate, they say, Al-Shabaab has to be either militarily uh, weakened, financially weakened, ideologically challenged, because after all, if you fight with them, but this ideology is still attracting some youngsters, some people in the countryside, you might not make a lot. You, not, you might not make a lot of progress in terms of fighting the ideology. So the fight against Al Shabaab is not only military; it's also ideological, it's economical, it's social, like anywhere else in the rest of the world. And based on the experiences we have seen from 1991, there is a very good chance that if Al-Shabaab is forced and is weakened militarily, socially, ideologically, then they can be forced to negotiate, or at least they can be split into two groups. So far, the Somali government has been uh, investing heavily on trying to get some people defected from Al-Shabaab. There were a number of high-profile people who defected from Al-Shabaab, but they have been defecting from Al-Shabaab since 2009. Yet that has not affected their capacity and their capability and their threat. So instead of focusing on getting people to defect from Al-Shabaab, why not militarily pressure them, ideologically pressure them, economically pressure them, and then try to change the mindset 
and the dynamic is on the ground and the geographical uh, presence of Al-Shabaab. If these steps are taken, many Somalis believe that Al-Shabaab can be significantly weakened. But I'm going to uh, conclude with my earlier remarks, unless there's a very strong, determined Somali government that has a strategy in building national army, that has a strategy in, fight, in fighting against Al-Shabaab and money laundering, that has a very viable, strong strategy to counter Al-Shabaab ideologically, then this fight is going to be a long war. And that's what we have now. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Arun, thank you so much for that uh, fascinating update. You offered the analogy with Afghanistan. So let me begin by asking you a question about the Taliban and Al-Shabaab. Uh, one uh, very effective thing the Taliban did was institute uh, a Sharia court system, uh, which was uh, scrupulously fair. It was unlike the Afghan government court system. It was not corrupt and it was expeditious. Uh, this really was an exercise of sovereignty where if you can administer justice, you're the sovereign of the area in which you administer it. Has Al-Shabaab been able to do that in Somalia? Do they have a functioning Sharia court system that's respected? Al-Shabaab has um, about two alif maktabis or departments, what they call department of uh, defense, department of politics, Department of the Jebhas, and there's also a department of, uh, of, of the courts, the department of Da'wah. Um, so they have courts and they have been taking civil cases, land disputes, um, marriage disputes. Um, they have been taking cases not only in the areas they control, but also there were reports of some people going to Al-Shabaab areas uh, seeking uh, justice. But Al-Shabaab court system is heavily flawed. It's biased. Um, Al-Shabaab does not believe in lawyers. They don't hold lawyers uh, for their accused. And there are significant, there's a significant, significant evidence that people who have the power in how these courts rule are the Amniyat. Amniyat are the security branch of Al-Shabaab that has the intelligence, the assassination unit, the explosive unit, all this come under the Amniyat. So people are taken to courts in many occasions and courts issue rulings without any evidence. Judges read statements saying that this person has confessed to the alleged uh, crime and they have ex executed number of people, countless number of people. So these Al-Shabaab courts have not, have not been transparent and the people who defected have testified and have told me that most of the people give forced confessions because they are tortured and they have a very uh, dangerous uh, prison service where people are tortured and they are forced to admit. So there's a, they, they have these court systems, but there are very uh, serious question marks. But, um, there were cases I documented where instead of um, inviting people who are who have dispute over land, for instance, one of the cases I came across, Al-Shabaab did not invite the people who were disputing. Instead of inviting, 
they sent assassins and they get rid of one of the uh, one, one of the people who were in the dispute because he did not obey their order to appear before the court. This happened. It's not just one case. There were a number of cases where Al Shabaab assassinated people who refused to appear or to recognize their courts. So they have this court system, but there are also these cases where people were either forcefully tortured and forced to confess, or people were assassinated because they have not accepted Al Shabaab rulings. Uh, or they have not accepted Al Shabaab summons to appear before their courts. But to answer the biggest question is that Al Shabaab uh, Taliban were hosting Al Qaeda, which, which is a transnational organization that believes in fighting global jihad. Al Shabaab is Al Qaeda that believes in global jihad, that wants to fight beyond the borders of Somalia. Uh, thank you, Haroon. Um, might I ask you, before we leave the subject of the legal system, you mentioned that uh, the legislature in Mogadishu uh, accepted Sharia as the law, or at least not any law in Somalia would contravene Sharia. Did that have a practical effect in the legal system? Did that have any meaning on the ground? It has a meaning on the ground because, um, for instance, Al Shabaab cases and cases of murder by members of the Somali military are taken by military courts. And these courts rely on Sharia in order to pass their judgments against the Al Shabaab, against killings, against murders against the attacks by Al-Shabaab, uh, these courts heavily rely on Sharia. Um, there are also civil cases in the country. Uh, the, the civil laws in the country also uh, refer to religion when they are passing on, on, on their judgment. There is a Somali penal code that was passed in 1964, which they also refer to when they are uh, passing judgments, so it has some meaning, and it also very it's also very important because the argument that's coming from Al Shabaab is that this is an apostate government, and they are fighting in order to impose Sharia in the country. But the Somali Parliament and the Somali government are saying, okay, Sharia is the basis uh, for the Somali laws. The Somali Constitution says any law that's against the Sharia is not a law. That's an article in the Somali constitution. Uh, so it's very important that Somalia has that because the, it's one of the articles that Al-Shabaab is using in order to uh, manipulate people and say this government is, uh, is, is imposing on man-made laws on the country. Now, in terms of its uh, larger ambitions, you mentioned in your 2018 Westminster talk that Al-Shabaab's objective was uh, a caliphate. Uh, of what dimensions? I mean, where, where, where would this caliphate be? And what would a universal caliphate? A universal caliphate. That's uh, very important. Al-Shabaab discussed this. In 2010, there was a large meeting that Al Shabaab held um, in, in, in southern Somalia. And the discussion was um, should we declare a caliphate in Somalia or should we uh, become part of a larger caliphate um, in, in the world? And the discussion the discussant people who were participating in that meeting uh, agreed that the caliphate they're looking for is a global caliphate. It's not just a small caliphate in a small part of Somalia or a small part of Africa. Um, this was also a contentious point because 
the leader of Al Shabab at the time, Ahmed Abdi Gudani, uh, argued, although he wants to wait that the larger caliphate, global caliphate, he still wants to be regarded as the uh, Amir al Mu'minin of Somalia, as the uh, or the leader of the Islamic Emirate or Somalia. And that has um, raised some rejection from some of the Al Shabaab scholars. One of the people, one of the scholars who rejected that notion uh, is Hassan Dair Awais. And he later on defected or forced to defect from the group. He is now in, under house arrest in Mogadishu. They rejected that idea. Um, and he did not want it to Ahmed uh, Abdi Kudane, the former Amir of Al Shabab, to be considered as the interim leader of an Islamic Emirate in Somalia. There are certain, uh, I'm not a religious scholar, but there are certain religious uh, articles that govern in the eyes of Al Shabab this kind of caliphate. And the scholars who attended that conference agreed that Al Shabab do not meet this criteria. So they need to be, since uh, they need to be part of large caliphate. And later on, to emphasize that role, they merged with Al-Qaeda in February 2012. But when the caliphate emerged in Iraq and Syria, that's when some members of Al-Shabaab asked the hard question, the leaders of Al-Shabaab, and said, OK, so the caliphate came. Why don't we join the caliphate? And then the question became political. What's going to be our role? Who is going to appoint and dictate us? We don't want somebody in Iraq and Syria to call the shots. We're going to stay as Al-Shabaab, as Al-Qaeda. And that's why they stuck with Al-Shabaab partially. Apart from the uh, emotional connection, the background they share with Al-Qaeda, uh, the leaders of Al-Shabaab, some of them were trained in uh, Afghanistan, they met Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Dawahiri. Because of that affinity and that connection, and because they did not want it to, loo to, lose, uh, um, to lose relevance in Somalia, they decided not to join the caliphate. But there was a time when the vast majority of Al-Shabaab members, the ordinary members, uh, were very keen on joining merging with ISIS. But Al-Shabaab saw the danger that they are losing their relevance, that their leaders felt that their positions will be in question, and they rejected the idea. And they went against the people who were advocating for this idea. They attacked it. They killed some of them. This is why a small number of Al-Shabaab defected and announced the Somali Islamic State group and merged it with the ISIS in Iraq and Syria in 2015. Uh, Haroon, you mentioned the uh, taxation system that Al-Shabaab has inside of Somalia, but that can't be sufficient to sustain them. I don't know how many troops they now have or the size of Al-Shabaab. You might mention current estimates. So where does the rest of the money come from and where do the weapons come from? This is very uh, important. Al-Shabaab is a complex organization. Uh, they are multifaceted organization. And they have been taxing businesses, uh, wealthy people, shops, all kinds of small businesses uh, in Mogadishu and in most of Somali town. Somali towns in South Central Somalia. But Al-Shabaab also controls the countryside, large, vast land in the countryside. And commercial goods leave major towns in Somalia in order to go, in order to, go to another town. And because Al-Shabaab is still capable of attacking not only the Somali government and African Union forces, but also civilian vehicles, these transportation vehicles, these commercial vehicles that are moving goods from one part of the country to another go through Al-Shabaab territory. And Al-Shabaab 
erect so many checkpoints throughout the country in order to tax this. They tax the goods, they tax the vehicles, and they tax the people. Uh, so Al-Shabaab is raising a lot of uh, vast amount of uh, money. In 2018, for instance, a local think tank estimated that Al-Shabaab collected $27 million. Uh, that's a lot of money in Somalia where uh, they pay, for instance, their uh, militias between $30 and $70 a month. Uh, and apart from this al Shabaab is involved in other uh, illicit uh, trades, they make money in other forms. Um, and there are, they also collect animals from the public, which they, from the, from the pastoral community, they collect thousands and thousands of animals, camels, uh, uh, sheep, goats, and you, as you might well know, uh, livestock is the uh, number one pillar of Somali economy, livestock exportation. Somalia heavily relies on livestock exportation. Uh, Somalia traditionally has relied rely on livestock exportation. And Al-Shabaab collects this large number of livestock which they redistribute some of them to poorer people. But we believe, and experts believe, that these animals are also sold, and they also, it's also, it also generates large amount of money, which they use to run their operations, including buying weapons. Uh, but they have also been carrying out uh, attacks in 2015, 2014, 2016, on military installations, they run over and they seize a large number of weapons which can sustain them for a long period. Um, so the weapons that they need to buy today are the explosives and explosive agents, TNT. This is the kind of weapons they buy recently from outside the country. But the rest of the weapon is, is abundance in the country. Somalia has been heavily weaponized heavily militarized country for decades because of the war between Somalia and Ethiopia and uh, because the former military government of Somalia has heavily imported weapons from the Soviet Union. These weapons are still in abundance in the country. And if you could briefly address the estimated size of the Al-Shabaab militia today. Uh, the estimated uh, size of Al-Shabaab, according to my book, uh, and my book, I base, I base it on that estimate uh, interviews I had with two Al-Shabaab defectors. Uh, the former number two Al-Shabaab, uh, Mukhtar Robo, and the former military intelligence officer of Al-Shabaab. And they both came to a very similar number. That is 13,000 men in Somalia. Estimates given by other experts range from 5,000 to 10,000. Uh, but this estimate has been in place since 2009, 2010. It's very, it's inconceivable that the number of Al-Shabaab members will stay the same for 10 years because they have been recruiting um, militias from the clans, uh, from the countryside, from their schools, and they have forced a number of clans to, as they call, donate young boys. Uh, for instance, Al-Shabaab has carried out a daring attack on Puntuland, that's a very stable, relative stable part of Somalia in 2016, and they lost a lot of men in this attack and also a large number of their attackers were captured. And the young men who were captured were aged, two out of 13, 14, um, 16, very uh, uh, young aged kids. Um, so that shows that Al-Shabaab has been recruiting 
from their schools, from the clans, from the madrasas, and they're still recruiting. They, the, the recruitment in large numbers and graduation of large number of Al-Shabaab recruits have uh, probably stopped recently because of the airstrikes, but the recruiting nonetheless has not stopped. And Al-Shabaab largely operates in small numbers anyway. They are a guerrilla group. They are carrying out hit, hit and run attacks, uh, apart from once in a while major attack on a military base. So I would estimate their numbers at least 13,000. Arun, some analysts say the United States uh, made, or let's say one aspect of the mistake they made in Iraq in 2003 was a lack of appreciation for the tribal system in that country. Uh, they thought, well, you know, Iraq's a very cosmopolitan place and, and we needn't take uh, the tribes into account. And there was a very low level of awareness of the importance of tribes. You mentioned the clans in Somalia. Um, are they of paramount importance? And how, how does the clan structure play out in respect to the government vis-a-vis al-Shabaab? Uh, that's very important <clears throat> question. Um, Somali clans have been an uh, important factor in the conflict in the country. I say this because in when the former government of Siad Barra collapsed in 1991, uh, clans became very important in the civil war. The clan militias have ransacked, destroyed towns, um, and they have taken the country in a downhill. Um, clan warlords have been marauding the country, and this is why the famine um, broke out in Somalia in 1991 and 92. This is why President Bush, Bush Sr., this is why President Bush Sr., sent 30,000 US troops to Somalia in December 1992 in order to um, degrade the clan warlords and help the aid reach people who need it. About a thousand people were dying in Somalia at the time. So the clans are a very important part of Somalia. Clans also played a very important part in the current government because the entire political system of Somalia is based on clan power sharing, so called 4.5 formula. There are four major clans and other smaller clans uh, that take half of what a major clan takes. So we have um, 275 members in the parliament. Each major clan takes 61 members. The rest, which is uh, half of that, 31 members, goes to the rest of the clans. So the clans are very important. So Al-Shabaab came and took advantage of this clan system. And uh, before Al-Shabaab, the Islamic courts came. Uh, that was very important because the Islamic courts convinced the clans that in the absence of government, the only way they can uh, restore some type of stability in their respective areas is to form Islamic courts that are based on clans. There were clan warlords that do not believe in Islamic courts, but there were religious scholars who wanted to set up Islamic courts in order to pacify in their respective areas, their regions. And this is the system that Al Shabaab and Salafi jihadists took advantage of. They, they got themselves embedded in the Islamic courts and they uh, strengthened it and grew within the Islamic courts until it was too late to stop in 2006. This is how Al-Shabaab emerged in 2006. Uh, so the clan system is very important. Al-Shabaab used that system 
in order to recruit uh, men, in order to recruit young boys, in order to collect weapons uh, from the clans. They still uh, gather, uh, hold meetings for the clan elders and ask them to bring 100 men from each clan and 100 guns, rifles. They, each, they still do that today. And Al-Shabaab uses that to their advantage. And they don't shy away from mentioning clans who support them. They name them and they say, these clans came to the, our aid. And because of that, they are ahead of the other clans and they force other clans to also to do the same. So they, they eulogize uh, this clan system and people who support them, uh, the clans who support them. But clans are also important and they can become a tool to fight against Al-Shabaab. Because when it comes to politics and political representation, clan representation is very important. There are still some clans who are supporting Al-Shabaab because they don't see themselves uh, to be benefiting from the current power sharing, which is the system that the Somali government is using. So the clan system can be used against them. I want to mention one very important. Clans also have weapons. The, the Somali National Army, I mentioned it earlier, one of the biggest challenges that is facing the Somali army is the clan issue. Why? Um, because there are efforts in order to integrate different clans into the Somali army so that they reflect the country. And that has not worked very well so far. And one other important thing is that about 30% of the weapons, according to the last assessment made by the Somali government, about 30% of the weapons that the, Somali army, so that the Somali army uses against Al Shabaab belongs to certain clans. So, this is why it's very important clans are engaged, represented in politics, and mobilized against Al Shabaab. Al Shabaab knows this danger and they continuously court clan elders. They continuously held seminars, workshops, endless. I have not seen um, within the last five years or so, the Somali government or the United States holding a meeting for Quran elders in Somalia. Al-Shabaab holds seminars and workshops for clans almost on a monthly basis, just to keep them in check and to make sure that they are um, intimidated, because this is also intimidation. There, was, there were meetings last year, for instance, that Al-Shabaab arranged with elders who selected delegates who will be voting for the MPs. I mentioned the agreement reached by the federal government and the Somali regional leaders today. This agreement says, each MP will be selected, or will be voted on by 101 delegates. These delegates will be selected by clan elders. So it's very important, this, any delegate selected by these clans, it's an important delegate. So this is why Al-Shabaab last year invited the clan elders and agreed a deal with them that they will not be participating in the elections, that they will not be electing delegates to elect um, MPs. I don't think that's going to stop the election taking place, but they can also manipulate these clan elders. So that's also another vulnerability. Before Al-Shabaab held this meeting for the clan elders, they assassinated 
dozens and dozens of delegates who participated in the last election in 2017 in order to scare people from participating in this process. Uh, so Al-Shabaab assassinates clan elders who don't listen to them, who participate in government elections and government programs, and they keep clan elders in check regularly in order to keep their support on their side. Um, if I may ask one last question, Haroun, I uh, supposedly Turkey has its largest overseas military base in Somalia for the purposes of training the Somali National Army. Uh, other countries have a presence there aside from the United States and interest, Qatar, the UAE. There seem to be a lot of players. Can you speak uh, briefly as to their competing interests and how that's playing out in, inside the country? Uh, th that's also, that's another very important question. Um, Somalia has a government that is very fragile, uh, just starting to stand on its feet. But Somalia also locates uh, on a very strategic part of Africa. Somalia has the longest coastline in Africa. Somalia is very close to the Middle East, uh, to the Far East. Um, and Somalia has a um, fast mineral resource. Um, Turkey came to Somalia, I'm going to start with Turkey, came to Somalia at a time with, when Somalia was going through a difficult time. That was in 2011. That was the second time since, the, since 1991 that Somalia suffered famine and thousands of people were dying uh, every day. And there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of international uh, attention to this disaster until the former prime minister, now the president of Turkey, Erdogan, visited Mogadishu in August, 2011. That visit led to visits from different countries and pledges from other countries, from Africa, from Arab countries, um, from Western countries, to see what was happening on the ground. It was a landmark visit that captured the hearts of Somalis because Turkey opened it, it is support to Somalia. Turkish charities went to Somalia. They helped people who were having uh, famine and starvation. And it was a turning point. It was a, it was a game changer. And um, it led to other countries doing the same and famine was contained. Then Turkey moved on to development programs building roads, uh, buildings, uh, rehabilitating all the government buildings, including the, the two buildings of the Somali parliament, the upper house, the Senate, and the lower house, and including uh, modernizing the, the seaport in Mogadishu, including modernizing the airport in Mogadishu. So Turkey heavily invested in Somali. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars were given to Somalia by Turkey in aid, but also billions of dollars were invested by Turkey in development projects. So the establishment of the military base came uh, in 2017. And that was uh, very significant because Somalia was training soldiers in Ethiopia, in Uganda, in Djibouti, in Kenya. And these troops were coming and they were 
just joining the fight against Al Shabaab. So there was no cohesion. There was no uh, uniform training. Uh, there were there were unit of Somali soldier, a brigade of Somali soldier trained by Ethiopia. And people would say, oh, this is Brigade X or Y, trained by Ethiopia or by the United Arab Emirates, by Kenya. By... So what Turkey did was it said, we're going to do a uniform training for all these different soldiers. So they set up a very modern military training, military training uh, in the country. But when uh, in 2017, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and Egypt and Bahrain cut ties with Qatar. Um, Somalia found itself in a difficult position. Why? The United Arab Emirates had a military training facility in Mogadishu and in other parts of the country. It was training Somali army and it was helping the government. And um, Saudi Arabia was financially help, financial helping the government. Turkey and Qatar were also helping the government, not only militarily, but also budgetary support. Turkey still, until today, gives $25 million budgetary support to Somalia. That's a lot of money when the budget of Somalia is $364 million, the annual budget. So that's significant. So you know, the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain and Egypt pressured Somalia, among many other countries, to cut ties with Qatar. And Somalia said, Qatar has been helpful to us in the same way you have been helpful to us. So we're not going to cut ties. We're going to stay neutral. But staying neutral was a lifeline. It was a reprieve for Qatar. Because when these countries uh, isolated Qatar, one of the airspaces that Qatar Airways and Qatar officials could use was Somalia in order to commute to the rest of the world, to Africa, to Asia, to, West, to the West. Somalia found itself in a very important place. So Qatar even got closer to Somalia. Qatar even was more respectful to the independent decision that Somalia has taken. Um, and then that led to United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia getting even more agitated and eventually um, um, one other important thing before I move on to that is that uh, there are individualists who are ideologically close to Qatar who are within the government, within the Somali government. So these individualists have vigorously defended Qatar. And the Somali government turned against the United Arab Emirates when UAE sent a plane load of cash, $9.5 million. The Somali government thought this money was for the opposition of the government in order to weaken the Somali government and transform the government into, or perhaps undermine the government in order to influence uh, the appearance or the emergence of a more pro UAE Saudi Arabia politicians. So the Somali government took a very decisive action. It closed the UAE uh, military training facility and it came very close to cutting ties um, with the UAE. The ties were not cut eventually, but the two governments are not in good terms. But that has uh, undermined uh, the, 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 the political stability. It certainly undermined the training of the Somali army.
because the United Arab Emirates was one of the countries that were really significantly improving uh, the Somali army. But that support has stopped now. The Somali government still has that $9.5 million. It has not returned it to the UAE. UAE asked for this money to be returned. The, the relations between the two countries is very, very complicated. Uh, we don't know if this election will change that, but um, Somalia got closer to African countries, to Ethiopia. The current Somali leadership uh, have got very close relations with the government of Ethiopia and the government of Eritrea. And that has also annoyed the government of Egypt because Egypt was also looking for Arab countries that support it is it is dispute with Ethiopia over the Nile over the Nile River. So some Arab countries support Egypt. Somalia is a member of the Arab League. It joined the Arab League in 1972. But Somalia also locates very strategic position, very close to Ethiopia. Egypt supported Somalia militarily, historically, when it was fighting against Ethiopia. Somalia has, this current government has changed that dynamic. It got closer to Ethiopia. It turned away Egypt. Egypt is very furious. Ethiopia is very happy. But Somalia is in a fragile situation. Arun, thank you very much for this extraordinarily rich presentation on Somalia and uh, Al-Shabaab today. Uh, and Al Shabaab's strategy. I greatly appreciate your return to the Westminster Institute. I thank our viewers and invite them to go to the Westminster Institute's webpage, where you will find this lecture posted, and you can uh, explore our other videos on the Westminster Institute YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Robert. It's an honor joining you, and I'm glad I've appeared at the Westminster Institute again.